Figure it out. Hello, this is Adam Korlick with Figure It Out Productions. The following video is part of our quick shoot series. Hey guys, it's Adam here, and uh, welcome to part one of my fifth generation video game uh, retrospective or recap series, whatever you want to call it. Uh, now, if you're not familiar, a while ago I made a series about the eighth generation of game consoles, the Wii U, the PS4, Xbox One, and I talked about my predictions for that, what the, each one of those consoles will do. And at the same time, I made a series about uh, the seventh generation consoles, Xbox 360, PS3, and Wii, and I just wanted to talk about, now that the generation was over, what my experience with them had been like. And people really liked that and asked me to do the 6th gen, PS2, Xbox, GameCube, Dreamcast, so I did it. And people really liked that. And then you guys kept asking for the 5th gen. So this only happened because you guys asked in mass over a long period of time. So here you go, we're going to talk about the 5th generation of game consoles. Now the first thing I want to say is, I'm sure, I, and I know actually, a lot of you said like just focus on the main ones, you don't have to do the little ones, we don't care. Most of you will think of this generation as the PlayStation and the N64. And then some of you will think of the Sega Saturn. And none of you will think of the Jaguar, the Amiga CD32, the 3DO, or some of the others. But the reality is, as much as we don't like them, or we don't care about them, or whatever, they were there. And I am fortunate enough to have some of them, so I want to talk about them. I want to include them. I think it's only fair. Because they're interesting for the generation as a whole. They're just interesting. And so I would very much like to include them. Now, I want to give shout-outs to three of them because I don't even own them. And I feel that they should at least be acknowledged. First up is the FM Towns Marty. This thing was kind of the beginning of the, what I kind of jokingly refer to as the graveyard generation. I mean, the, most of the fifth generation is a graveyard. Some might refer to it as generation 4.5, but I prefer the term graveyard generation. Now, this console only came out in Japan. It never saw a release outside of there. It actually came out in February of 1993. That was a long ass time ago. So while we all think of this generation as really starting in like 1995 and 96, believe it or not, regardless of what your opinion might be, it actually started in 93. And I know what you're thinking. That's the way I feel about it too. I feel like, oh, this is where it started. This is what the real console war was. I don't include any of that. I'm being as technical with you as possible. Like it or not, the generation started in 1993 with the FM Towns Marty. Just did. Neo Geo CD. This one's interesting because it's actually not 5th gen. It's technically still in the 4th gen, so why bring it up? For some reason, it came out after some of the 5th gen consoles, yet is still a 4th gen console. No idea. I just, I don't make the rules. I just thought I'd tell you guys about it. Next up was the PCFX. This was a console made by NEC. It was their successor console to the PC Engine, which had been insanely popular in Japan. We know it as the TurboGrafx-16, and it really wasn't that popular over here. Uh, but uh, maybe for that reason, it never got a release outside of Japan. Maybe they were thinking, well, the PC Engine only did well here, so we'll just release the PCFX here, and if it does well, great, maybe we'll release it in other parts of the world. If it bombs, then we'll release it anywhere. And I'm pretty sure it bombed. I don't know that for sure. Uh, and so they probably said, ah, the hell, they were done. And they never released it anywhere else. That's just, I don't know the full story, that's just my guess. I've only seen them online, I've never seen either one of those consoles in person. And uh, the third one, this is the most fascinating one to me. If I could get any one of those three, it would be this one. This goes out to all the people out there who have, over the years, said, I really wish Apple would make a console. It would be the best shit ever, Apple this, Apple that. Now I'm not really a supporter of Apple either way, I don't, I'm completely indifferent. I don't buy their products, but I don't boycott them either. But, um, yeah, Apple made a console in the 90s. They did. It was called the Pippin. Now, to be fair, this was some sort of deal they struck up with Bandai, uh, where the two of them worked together to make this game console. And as far as I can tell, and I could be wrong about this, I'm just basing it off what, because there's not a whole lot of information out there on this thing. But as far as I can tell, Bandai had agreed they would release this thing in Japan under their name, because Japanese companies do a lot better in Japan than foreign companies do. It's just the nature of the Japanese market. They're very nationalistic. They only like to buy things that is Japanese. So Apple going in there would not have worked at all. Ironically, Apple's actually very popular there now, but they weren't at the time. And Apple was in charge of releasing it, I think, everywhere else. And even further into the irony here, uh, it only did decently in Japan. It didn't do well. But it bombed like shit everywhere else. And there, at least, if you look online, you can at least find the Japanese version online. The American one is gone. I've only seen it one time. 
in person. I saw it at a local game store here in Chicago. The guy had it in the box. I was stunned to see it. But it was extraordinarily expensive. And I was like, oh, God, I want it. But no, no, I can't, I can't do it. I can't justify it. Came home, and I couldn't help but think about it for the next couple of days. It was just like eating me up. And I went back there, probably telling myself, you're just going to look at it. You know, you're not going to buy it. I know you brought the money with you, but you're not going to buy it. It's not going to happen. So I got there, and they didn't have it, which I, I thank my wallet. I think, in hindsight, my wallet thanks me for that. Um, but I asked the guy, like, did you put it in back? What happened? And he was like, oh, no, we sold it. It was in here for a couple of hours, and it gone. He was amazed I'd even seen it. So I've seen one one time. That was it. Very rare console. Not very good. I think the only game I can even, the only game I can even recall for it is there's some Power Rangers Zeo game on it. Nothing special. The games are extremely expensive, too. But the point is, Apple did make a console. And they made it during that weird era where they had fired Steve Jobs, but before they brought Steve Jobs back. There was an era where they ran themselves into the ground in the 90s. They decided one of the things they wanted to do was make a game console. Which is what they went for. Um, now, that kind of leads me into, uh, now that we've talked about those, that kind of leads me to the next point. How is it that we had that many different game consoles? That's nine. I mean, look at the modern generation. There's three. Generation four, three. We've been used to that. Nintendo, Sony, Microsoft. Nintendo, Sony, Microsoft. Before that, Nintendo, Sony, Microsoft, and Sega for a brief, fleeting whisper of time. That's, that's all they had. I love my Dreamcast. Fucking love it. But it was only around for a very brief time in the sixth generation. How is it that you go a generation before that and you have nine damn game consoles? Well, I have a theory on that. It's not obviously not sure, because it's just a theory, but let me explore it with you. So my theory goes that you have to explore all the way back to the first generation of game consoles. Now that generation was just Pong clones and shit, but it introduced the world to this thing, video games. And people were excited about it, but they understood when they were buying a Pong clone thing that it was a dedicated machine that was only capable of doing one thing. So you get to the second generation, and what do they do? They release the Atari 2600. They release the ColecoVision. In certain parts of the world, you got the Sega SG-1000. You know, you got stuff like that. And people are saying, like, I can change the cartridges out. This is a home game console. But at that point in world culture, we were not used to this concept of updating. Now, what I mean by, what I mean by updating is, you know, we're all used to now the idea, oh, there's another generation coming out, we're going to buy all the new hardware. Or, oh, my phone is dying, I've got to go buy a new one. Or my TV is a few years old, I need a new one. Or, you know, whatever. You know what I'm saying. Like, you have to buy, or PC parts. There you go, a new, new PC. you got to go in every few years. We're used to that. That concept was basically non-existent at that point in time. I mean, sure, if your toaster broke or something, you'd go buy a new one. But for the most part, you didn't update your electronics. When you went to Sears or whatever and you bought this Atari 2600, you expected to hook it up to your TV, and that's just your game console for 40 years. That was just the way it was. Because the only thing you were ever used to kind of updating was your car, which you would do maybe 10 or 20 years. You know, like, you didn't update a car very often either, and you still don't. Do you see my point? So you have that situation, plus, of course, all the other crap that happened with the video game crash, you know, shit tons of bad games, but also a crap ton of different console manufacturers who are just throwing their hat in the ring and saying, this is a hot new industry, I'm going to make a machine, and we're going to make some money. So you have way too much shit, and then it just pff, blew up. Right? So the video game crash happens in 1983. It's blamed entirely on E.T. It really shouldn't be. The very small part of the reason that shit happened. But it happened. So what happens after that? All these game companies say, fuck it, I'm out. I am not making game consoles. That thing is a dead, that's a dead horse. But who else comes out of that? Nintendo. Now, you can love Nintendo. You can hate Nintendo. You feel totally indifferent to Nintendo. It doesn't matter. The reality is you owe your gaming culture and interest, you owe it all to Nintendo. They saved it. They saved the entire industry. Regardless if you hate that console, regardless if you hate that company, they saved gaming. They just did. They brought it back to relevance. They showed people there was a market. They showed people that you can actually have a good time with this. They explained the concept of updating your console. They explained everything. They made it all work. So, but they had very little competition in that generation. Atari threw their hat back in the ring. You know, they had the Atari 2600, as I mentioned before. In the second generation, they also launched another console, the Atari 5200, which is what had created that whole problem with updating, where people didn't understand that shit. 
And they actually tried to launch the Atari 7800 in the same second generation, which is insane. They had built it, they had, pro they had designed it, they had engineered it. I think they had done everything short of actually build the units for retail before they axed it. So once the NES came out, they said, oh shit, we had this whole thing ready to go. Let's just build them and get them out there. So that's exactly what they did. So they used this console that had been out, you know, been designed like three years earlier. I think that's the only reason Atari even tried in that generation. And then you had Sega, who came out with the Master System, which never defeated the NES. Let's not get it twisted. It did, ex it did amazing in South America. Dominated. Did incredibly well in Europe. Did okay in Japan. Did very, very mediocre in North America. But point is, Sega stood up there and said, they were the one guy, if we think of these people as guys, the one guy who was willing to stand in the shadow of Nintendo and say, me too. They were the guys brave enough and bold enough to say, we can do this. But they were still at it alone. Because nobody else took them seriously. Everyone else looked at it and said, Nintendo. If it's not Nintendo, it's not a game console. It's not a real thing. It will never win. So then you enter the fourth generation. What happens there? Genesis versus SNES, or Mega Drive versus SNES. And that was an epic battle in which Nintendo, I'm gonna, as much as I love Sega, they're my favorite hardware manufacturer of all time. Absolutely love them. But the reality is they never won. They did not win that generation. Is it economically. We can debate games all day, up and day, you know, up and down, left and right, all day long. We can debate games. We're not doing that. I'm talking about economics. The market share. I think at Nintendo's lowest and Sega's highest, it was 53 to 47. 47 being Sega. Now, they didn't win, but what did that tell everyone? It told them, you don't have to be named Nintendo to win in a console uh, market. You can do that as someone else. That's what Sega taught everybody. So then we get to the fifth generation. And the fifth generation became almost like, in retrospect, what it basically was, was like one of those reality shows, like The Bachelor, The Bachelorette, you know, where they have those 10 guys or 10 girls all up in a row, and then you hand each one of them a, you know, a rose if they're still there. That is what that generation ended up becoming. Because they saw there was room. There was room for someone else, not named Sega and not named Nintendo. There was a room for a third guy to come in. We obviously know who that was, it ultimately would prove to be, this guy right here. But you didn't know that at the time, and you gotta think of it that way. You gotta think of it at the perspective of the time. Every single company thought, I can try this and make it work. And we'll talk about each one as we go in different videos, but I find that fascinating, just that that happened. And that's also another reason that generation was so unique, because Let's look at the, the most recent generation to complete itself, right? The seventh gen. Again, you had three consoles the whole time. And you had a generation that lasted eight years. You know, starting in 2005 and ending in 2013. That's a long damn time for a console generation. You young kids out there do not understand that, probably. But that's a rarity. That doesn't happen. That is the only time that has happened where the, the three main competitors were there the entire time and lasted for that damn long. It doesn't happen. This generation was unique because it lasted for the same amount of time. It lasted from 1993 with the FM Towns Marty all the way until 2001 when the GameCube came out and replaced the N64. Again, eight years. Isn't that kind of weird to think about how long that generation really was? Now I'm sure, like, like most of you, I don't really feel like these are part of that generation. Even though they are, they don't feel like it. There's a difference between knowledge and feelings, if that makes any sense. We all feel like these are the ones, right? But the reality is they're there. And they kicked it all off. They started the whole thing. And they, but rather than be a generation like the seventh gen, where they all three stayed there the whole time, they had this weird, like, pass the baton logic. You know, the FM Towns Marty launched, failed, passed the baton to another console. That console launched, failed, passed the baton to another console, and kept going all the way until they held out for a few years until we got to these three, which duked it out for a few years before the Dreamcast kicked it off, and then we went into the sixth gen. That's just, it's such a weird generation in hindsight, but it's a generation that I love. You know, it was the first generation that I could fully appreciate. See, I was born during the third gen, so I have no knowledge of its existence at the time. You know, like, how the hell? I'm just born. All right, hand me an NES controller. I gotta play. Like, that wasn't something that was gonna happen. You know, it wasn't until the, the first, when I was old enough to actually even try video games, like physically, to be able to understand that I'm playing a game and I'm doing anything, when I have any motor skills of any kind, when I'm at that age, the Super Nintendo and the Genesis are already out, you know? And so that's what I'm playing. And I'm just thinking, this is a video game. This is all that a video game is. 
it wasn't until these consoles, and I mean particularly these two, because this is what I had as a child, it wasn't until these came about where I was like, that is the next level. Because I've said this in my sixth gen recap series, but my feelings towards game, uh, this generation in comparison to the other ones was that, say with the fourth generation, up until then, game programmers had only been working with 2D. It was all they knew. So obviously the technology would advance and they could advance with it, but they were also able to understand mechanics better and what made a game more fun in a 2D plane, right? And then you finally have the technology to back that up. So you made some of the best games ever in the fourth gen. And the sixth gen was very much the same because it had the fifth gen preceding it where they learned the nature of 3D games. They had to relearn the whole damn thing. They had to learn, like, all right, throw everything we learned out of the book, you know, throw, throw it all out. We have to start all over here and learn what the mechanics are of a 3D game. Not just the programming mechanics, but, like, what is fun versus what is not fun to do on a 3D plane. And obviously they perfected that in the sixth generation, in my opinion. And that's not to say the fifth generation wasn't fun or anything. It was fucking awesome. But it was just, it was the beginning. It was the birth. It was the, I don't want to use this console's name necessarily, but it was the genesis of that whole thing, of the 3D gaming that we think of now. And it, it was the shit. It really was. So, um, yeah, that's just kind of the overview there. And uh, as far as their history. Now, the only other things I really want to address in this general subject video is just a couple of things that are worth noting about this generation. It was the first generation that introduced us to the Game Shark, which was, I grew up on that shit, man. I played that shit on my N64 all the time. You know, you put, you play Goldeneye with extra codes and it would be fun as hell. Same with the PlayStation. I didn't have a Saturn as a child, or I probably would have used it more. Uh, Game Genie was phased out at that point, but Game Shark was revolutionary because it saved the damn codes. Um, it also, it didn't introduce us to CD consoles. You know, that was the TurboGrafx CD and the Sega CD more famously. But they were add-ons, you know. But it, it told us all, like, this is what's happening now. Games are going to start being on these, like, round discs. And the advantage to that, as a gamer, was that you were going to have better video and better music and uh, stuff like that. You didn't understand that it was also holding better storage capacity and it was cheaper for them to produce, which they could somewhat pass the savings on to you. You didn't understand that at the time. I know I sure shit didn't. But in hindsight, that's really very neat. And you only had two cartridge consoles, because this was the last generation that had any cartridge consoles. Uh, the Atari Jaguar and the N64. Of course, the N64 is the last cartridge console of all time. But for now, that's it. That is, the, uh, that is part one of the uh, fifth generation retrospective series. I hope you guys have enjoyed it. Uh, stay tuned. Uh, part one will be the Amiga CD32 by Commodore. Aren't you excited? You've probably never even heard of this console, except for all the recent Euro video, European videos I did where I talked about it a lot. So maybe you have heard of it. Never mind. You guys are a lot smarter than I give you credit for sometimes. You guys are the best. But anyway, thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you all later.